Praise the Lord. Church, I said, praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for our workers training tonight. And I pray that the Lord himself will speak to every heart in Jesus' name. And the training, the teaching, will not be in vain in any life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being called your sons and daughters and also your servants and soul winners. We're asking, Lord, that tonight you reveal your might to every one of us in Jesus' name. We're asking, O oh Lord, that this understanding of walking with you, you expound to each individual so that everyone will have the grace as well as the vision to know what it means to walk with you comprehensively throughout our lives in Jesus' name. Help us to pay attention, to hear you as you speak, and then to respond to do as you want us to do. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Genesis chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 22, Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Very early in the history of man, in the history of humanity, after the fall, as Adam and Eve had departed from the Lord, and they were no more in intimate relationship and fellowship with God, others were being born after Cain, and Abel, and Seth, and sons and daughters, eventually Enoch was born. And as the Bible says, all have seen and come short of the glory of God. Enoch lived the way other people lived, without the grace and without the strength of the Lord for 65 years. At the age of 65, something happened to him. He turned to the Lord. And he lived to please the Lord. And the Bible says in Genesis 5.22 that Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. Verse 24 again, and Enoch walked with God. That walking with God, the New Testament explains the implication and what that actually means. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Join those two things together. In Genesis it says, he walked with God. The interpretation, the understanding, the exposition, the explanation of that in the New Testament is that he pleased God. As we bring those two things together, what does walking with God mean? That you live in such a way that you please God every day, every moment of your life. How could you do that when you were born in sin? How could he have done that when he was born in sin? The New Testament explains, by faith, Enoch was translated. That he should not see death. By faith, he was not found. By faith, God translated him because he pleased God. He came to faith in the Lord. He knew he couldn't walk with the Lord. God is mighty. We are small. God is holy, we are righteous. God is pure, 
without any blemish, we're impure. And the only way we can walk with God is to turn from our sinful life, our natural life, our human life, and place our face in the Lord. And it was that face that helped him to walk with God and to please God. Look at verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. Without faith, Enoch could not have pleased God. Without faith, anyone will read about in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, without that faith, no one could have pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe. He that comes to God, a point came in Enoch's life. He decided, I will come to God. I'm separated from God. I'm far away from God. I want to walk with God. And the initial experience is getting out of where you are spiritually and morally. And then coming to God, he, by that way, he turned from his old life. And he came to God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. He must believe that God is who he says he is. He must believe that God is holy because God says I'm holy. He must believe that God is so purer eyes to condone and to behold sin. And because of that, he believes that God is who he says he is and he turns away from sin. Not only that, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's what he not did. He sought the Lord so that he'll be forgiven his past. He sought the Lord so the Lord will set him free. He sought the Lord so that his life will be aligned with God, with God's character. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, we are now instructed and we are commanded and we're shown the way to walk with God. First Thessalonians chapter 4, I read from verse 1, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God. Those two words are not joined together. Walking with God, pleasing God, the same? The synonymous. We have showed you how you will walk with God. What's that? What does that mean, Apostle Paul? How you will please God in every area of your life. As you consider your life in the private, in the public. You consider your life in the church and in your community. You consider your conduct, your character. Anywhere you are, everywhere you are, and you are walking with God, you know what that means? You are pleasing God every time. Every choice you make, every direction you go, every decision you make, and every interaction you have, anything you do, whether people see or not, whether you are alone or with other people, you are walking with God means you please God, so you would abound more and more. It says there's no vacation from this one, and there is no retirement from this one, and there is no laying this aside. You are walking with God, you are walking with God until you see Him face to face. It says, So ye would abound more and more, for ye know what ye, what we command, the commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You see the connection there? You're saved, you're walking with God, but that walk with God will not be perfect yet until the sin within is taken out. The carnality is taken out. The inbred sin is taken out. The Adamic nature that made Adam to go away from God, that is taken off, and now it says this is the will of God. And if you're going to walk with God, you're in agreement with God. If you're going to walk with God, you know that His will is your will, His desire is your desire, and His commandment is what you want to go at. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. 
your sanctification, the salvation, before you can begin to walk with God, the sanctification, as you make up your mind by the grace of God, you are going to walk continually and consistently and courageously with the Lord. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Tonight, we're looking at the message, the glorious privilege of walking with God. The glorious privilege of walking with God. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the glorious experience of walking with God. It's an experience. It starts at a point in time. And it's an experience we have. It is that experience we have that moves us, that launches us into a lifetime of career of walking with God. Number one, the glorious experience of walking with God. Number two, the gracious examples of walking with God. Has any other person done it before? So I will know if a person of flesh and blood like myself has done it and did it well and did it to please God and did it and God was satisfied if one person was able to do it in his own generation, I too can be that one person in my community, in my generation, and I can walk to please God if we have two or ten or many people uncountable who have walked with God. If it was possible for them, then it is possible for me. I can walk with God. Point number two then, the gracious examples of walking with God. As we walk with God, does that mean that all we do is that we're just walking and walking and we do nothing else? Not really. There are other things we do as we're walking with God. Point number three, our gospel engagement while walking with God. Our glorious godly engagement while we're walking with God, God himself is doing something. And if we are going to walk with God, we are in agreement with God. What he does, we do. Christ is doing something. And if we're going to walk with Christ, we must be in agreement with him and do what he's doing. The Holy Spirit is doing something every moment and every time in the world in which we're living. And if we're going to be in agreement with the Holy Spirit and we're walking with the Father, we're walking with the Son, we're walking with the Holy Ghost, we must do as the Father is doing, as Christ, as Savior is doing, and as the Holy Spirit is doing. Point number three then, our godly engagement while walking with God. We'll come to number one, the glorious experience of walking with God. This is the place it starts. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 13. It tells us in verse 13, from the very lips of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. In verse 14, for straight is the gate, that means small is the gate, tight is the gate, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. If we're walking, we're walking in the way. And if we're going to walk in the way, we need to understand the way he has outlined. The race he has put down that we walk in this way. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Which lead us unto life and few there be that find it. To start with, we cannot follow the way of the majority. We cannot follow the way of society. We cannot follow the way of the common man. We cannot follow the way that other people have said, this is the way they enjoy this, they take pleasure in this. The majority of people, Jesus said, they walk in the way that leads to perdition. 
that leads to destruction that leads to hell, that leads to eternal punishment. Then they said, few are the people that enter through that straight gate. That's the gate of conversion. The gate of salvation is very narrow. It will not take the sinner and his sin. At that gate, it drops on his sin. At that gate, it drops all his conflict with the Almighty God. At that gate, it drops all his argument against the way of the Lord. At that gate, the gate of salvation, the gate of regeneration, the gate of conversion, he draws all the human traits that he knows personally he has been practicing. That's repentance. And it is that repentance that leads to the prayer of confession. And it is that confession that leads to believing on the Lord. It is that repentance and faith in Christ that leads to salvation. No man without salvation, without entry through that gate, can walk with God. That's why it says, enter ye in at the straight gate. We are looking at Luke chapter 13. In Luke chapter 13, I'm actually going to read verse 23 to 25, but I'm going to back up to verse 3 and verse 5. Jesus said in verse 3, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We must enter through the gate of repentance. We must enter through the gate of dropping all our sin, dropping all our evil, before we say now, I'm walking with God. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, I tell you, nay, ex but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That gauge of repentance is through which, the gate through which everybody enters. There's no way, there's no other way for us to enter into the way of God and then to walk with the Lord. You cannot great crash. You cannot just join in somewhere on the road and uh, try to dress like us and try to talk like us and try to attend all the meetings and try to do some work. All those works will not save you. You must go back to the gate where you repent and call upon the Lord and then you are saved. After that salvation, you now begin to walk with God. We're looking at verse 23 now. In verse 23, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Don't just say, I want to walk with God in my own strength, in my own ability, in my own power, in my own endeavor, in my own efforts. I'm going to walk with God. I try the best I can. I will turn over a new leaf and then I will pull myself up. I will walk with the Lord. Look at this. Try to enter in at the straight gate. Endeavor to enter in at the straight gate. You must repent. And you must kneel in humility before the Lord and turn away from all your sin and enter in. Any sin unconfessed, any sin not given up, any sin that you cherish and you're embracing will hinder you from entering. Kick it off. Take it off from your life and strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. They're holding tradition like the Pharisees and they still want to enter in. They will not be able. They're holding on to some cherished sins, cherished habits, and they want to enter in. They shall not be able. They're holding on to the religion of their fathers, religion of the elders, and they want to enter in. 
they shall not be able. They're holding on to the old covenant. And they send up to all the seven in the Bible. And they're holding on to those things that are abolished. And Christ is the way, the only way for us to get into life eternal. Any other sin they're holding on to will hinder them from entering. It says, many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door and you begin to stand outside the door without the door and to knock at the door saying lord lord open unto us and he shall answer and say unto you i know you're not whence ye are then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. We were there when you multiplied the bread. We attended your retreat. We attended your conference. We attended your meetings. And because we, atten we heard everything you said, we even ate the miracle food. They said, that eating in his presence, and thou hast taught in our streets you even came to our community and you taught us there it's not what you heard it's what you do with what you hear he taught in their streets but they were not converted they didn't repent they didn't strive to enter in at the straight gate they were religious but they were not righteous look at verse 26 uh, verse 25, uh, at the latter end, it says, And he shall answer and say, I know you not when ye are. It's very important that we enter at the gate. We turn away from sin. We turn away from evil and become children of God. That's how we now begin to walk to please God. In Second Corinthians chapter six, Second Corinthians chapter six, I read from verse fourteen: Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You see the yoke in the Old Testament; they yoke two animals together. And those two animals will be plowing the field. They'll be walking and walking. They'll be moving and plowing as they were yoked together. But they were warned. They will not yoke an ox as well as an, o as an ox together to plow. They must be of the same nature. And so the Lord says here now, Bring that Old Testament illustration to the New Testament. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. In walking with God, you cannot be yoked together with unbelievers. In walking with God, you cannot be tied together with unbelievers. In walking with God, you cannot be in agreement with an unbeliever. And you cannot be moving with an unbeliever. You cannot be intimately friendly in fellowship with an unbeliever. You cannot be in business with an unbeliever because God will not walk with that unbeliever. And you want to walk with God. If you are going to walk with God, you must separate yourself in every way, in every form, with those unbelievers. Be not on the call you together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with the righteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? Light and darkness getting married? No, it will not work. A believer getting married to an unbeliever and says, I'm still walking with God. No, it will not work. Light and darkness, the one in the light and the other one in the darkness of occultism. And they're walking together. No, it will not work. And you cannot be unequally yoked together in business with um, an occultic person. 
I will somebody will go and sacrifice something to an idol before he comes to work. It says, What concord as Christ with Belial? Or what patch as see the believers with an with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. If we're going to walk to please God, understand, it says, I will dwell in them. And because God is holy, it says the holy God will dwell in us. Because God is righteous, the holy God will, uh, the righteous God will dwell in us. And because he's pure, and our purer eyes than to behold iniquity, it said he will dwell in us and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What's the condition then that God Himself has laid down? If we're going to go through that straight gate, if we're going to walk with God, look at verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them. If you're still with them in secret society, you cannot walk with God. If you're still with them in their idolatrous tradition, you're not walking in with God. Whatever you profess, I'm saved. That's talk of mouth. I'm sanctified. That just talk. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. If you are with them in their character, if you're with them in their conduct, if you're with them in their fraud, if you're with them in the evil they do, if you're with them in the worship of idols, if you're with them in any secret sin, all the testimonies you are giving will just be empty talk. But it says, wherefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Touch not the unclean thing. What's that? Whatever. Your touch that makes you feel unclean. What's that? Whatever your touch that arouses uncleanness from your heart. If you're walking with God, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, that means God is talking to both men and women. My sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We will walk with God. There will be no secret sin. There will be no evil in our lives. We will be transparently righteous. And we will be thoughtful and careful. Whatever we do and wherever we go. Because God is watching. And he says, so come out from among them before you can walk with him. We're looking at John chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 11. John chapter 8, we're reading from verse 11. It tells us in John chapter 8, verse 11, And she said, No man, Lord, 11. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. I forgive you. That's the gate at which we enter the kingdom. That's the gate at which we enter. And now, after entering, we can now continue to walk with God. Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Go to your place of work. In that place of work, sin no more. Go to your community. Where you live, in that community, sin no more. Go back to your market. In that market, go and sin no more. If you draw water from the well, far away from your house, go to the well. But on the way and coming back, sin no more. If you're working in the factory, textile factory, together with other people, and you know what you have been doing with them, but you can go back straight to your work, but go and sin no more. Go back to your family, and in your family, the things you have been doing that led to accumulated habits, that made you and pushed you to do what you did. Now you are forgiven. You have entered through the gate, Go and sin no more. In verse 12, 
Then speak Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me, walking with me, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Walking in walking with God, you'll not walk in darkness, you'll not walk in secrecy. The people, even though they go to church, or let's say they come to our church, you don't really know them. They're too secretive. And it says, when you are walking with God, you will not be secretive. You're doing things and you're covering up. And if you ever open up to anybody, you're telling them, don't allow anybody to hear this. I like to preserve my secrets. They're walking in darkness. And they're doing things that cannot see the light of day. And because of that, the Lord is saying, you, are not, you have not really started walking with me, because he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We're looking at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. How do you know they are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh? Who walk not after the flesh? Those who are still fleshly, those who are filthy, and those who give their body to sinning, sinful habits, either to make money or just to give their neighbor's pleasure. All those who are like that walking in the flesh, they're not walking with God. They have not been born again. Those who are born again, there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death holds no water in my life anymore. Normally, when you throw something up, it will come down. Why? Because of the law of gravity. But we know the aeroplane. It's been so constructed, it's been so made, all the things that make up the aeroplane have now been so conditioned that that aeroplane gets up and the law of gravity to bring it down does not affect it anymore. The same thing, every human being, he tries to get up. The law of sin and death will bring him down. But now there is a grace of God that has come in. And that grace of God comes into him. He cannot go up and the law of sin and death will not bring him down. The law of sin and death will not bring you down. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those are the people who are walking with God. No more walking after the flesh. No more walking after sinful practices. No more walking after evil character. No more walking after the propensity of their sinful nature. But now they are walking in the Spirit, empowered, energized, graciously held to stand upright and to live an upright life. Romans chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 11. Romans chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 11. And that knowing the time 
now, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation, final redemption, nearer than when we believed. The night is past spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. In Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, this I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance, emulations, wrath, anger, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, before the judgment day, as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who are still living in all these things and such like, they have not entered through that narrow gate and they are not walking in the way of God. They may do it occasionally. They may do it when temptation comes to them. They may do it when church members are not around. They may do it when there's nobody to challenge them. They may do it because they have silenced everybody. Anybody that can look at them and challenge them, they have silenced them with bold face and with some actions. But it says, whether you silence others or not, if you're doing this, you will not get to the kingdom of God because you are walking in the flesh. Verse 22, not walking in the spirit, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh. Those who belong to Christ who are walking in the Spirit. And they are walking with God. They have crucified the flesh with their afflictions and laws. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If the Spirit dwells in us, and now the Lord has helped us to walk in the Spirit. It says, let's live in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. First John chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. First John chapter 1. We're reading from verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. No darkness at all. No darkness at all. If we are walking with God, there will be no form or shade of darkness in our lives. Verse 6, if we say 
we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth if we walk in the light as he is in the light as he our god is in the light as he christ is in the light if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another we have fellowship one with another if you're walking in darkness we cannot have fellowship with you and you cannot have fellowship with us it will mean that darkness and light are having fellowship together there may be normal things that we do that makes us come together we ain't on the same boss we have no choice but that's not fellowship and we're working in the same industry we have no choice that's no fellowship and we're going to the same office we have no choice that's not fellowship but to come into fellowship and to have heart to heart understanding heart to heart intimacy and to join our lives together and to expose ourselves to you and you to expose yourself to us and to walk in the same way and go to the same destination that cannot happen because it's only if we walk in the light as sees in the light that we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin the question is has there been any other apart from Enoch that we have known much about that walked with God and that served the Lord continuously without going back to the works of the flesh and without going back into darkness and without going back to join affinity with Satan or the followers of Satan yes there have been that leads us to point number two the gracious examples of walking with God. There are some people that feel that the Old Testament people they didn't have grace, and because they didn't have grace, they didn't have faith also, and they couldn't walk with God. That's not true. That's not true. They think that all those thousands of years, about 4,000 years from Genesis to Malachi, that nobody in the Old Testament actually walked with God. That's not true. Grace was available. And faith was available. And by faith, through the grace of God, they walked with God. Let's look at some of them. I'm looking at Genesis chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 22. Chapter 5 of Genesis, verse 22. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. You're married. Can you walk with God? Yes, you can. You have sons and daughters. Can you walk with God? Yes, you can. Your teenage children are growing up and they have all these uh, pranks and all that. Can you still walk with God? Yes, you can. Enoch walked with God. We don't know much. We don't even know anything about his wife. But he walked with God. There's some people that mortgage their spiritual lives in the hands of their wives, in the hands of their husbands. If the husband is doing this, then I will also do like that. Focus on your walking with God. Focus on your getting to heaven. You came to this world all by yourself. You will leave this world all by yourself. And if you're going to get to heaven, if you're going to be a partaker of the rapture, you as an individual must walk with God. That's what happened to Enoch in verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Noah walked with God. Genesis chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. 
Noah walked with God. Beyond this family, there were no righteous people. Beyond this family himself, his wife and three sons and three daughters, nobody believed the word of God that the flood was coming. But even though the millions and millions and millions of people at that time on earth did not believe, he singled himself out. That's what God wants you to do. Whatever others do, whatever others do not do, you make up your mind and all the conviction you need, all the courage you need, the Lord will give you in Jesus' name. That whatever other people do, however other people live, like Noah, you walk with God, Noah walked with God. Look at verse 22. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Even though the other people were living as they pleased, but he pleased God, chapter 7, verse 1, and the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou, and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous. Thee, thee only, have I seen righteous before me in this generation. We've heard about Abraham, that Abraham too walked with God. Genesis chapter 48, I'm reading from verse 15. Genesis chapter 48, verse 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk. My father Abraham walked before God. My father Isaac walked before God. The God which fed me all my life long unto this day. At that time, there was no church. At that time, there was no priesthood. At that time, the Levites had not come to take over, to take the walk in the sanctuary. At that time, there's no sanctuary even. But these ones, their minds were on God, their hearts were on God, and they walked with God in all the light they had. You remember Zechariah? I'm looking at 2 Kings chapter 20. In 2 Kings chapter 20, I'm reading here from verse 3. They walked with God. Even though they might have been isolated, they walked with God. Even though they were not, there wasn't any encouragement from companions, they walked with God. Even though they appeared to be alone and lonely, they walked with God. And the same thing, if it was possible for them, it is possible for us, we can walk with God. I can walk with God. I will walk with God. Whatever others do, whatever others do not do, you make up your mind that you, with all the light you have, and you have the whole Bible in your hand, and you have the people, the examples, God helps them. And even though you are the only one in your place of work, the only one in your community, the only one in your village, the only one in your extended family that has now seen the light, you make up your mind, their influence will not pull you down. Their influence will not corrupt you. Their influence will not draw you back into darkness. Even though you may see people all around you, and all these people, they are not distinct for righteousness, and they are not distinct and distinguished for walking in, in the light. You make up your mind, you will be that single individual. Your walk with God, your walk with God in Jesus' name. Second Kings chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 3. I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth. If it wasn't true, his prayer would not be answered. If he was so lame saying this by word of mouth and it was not real, 
God would not have listened to him because he had an incurable disease, a terminal disease. And Isaiah had said, you are going to die. But he didn't want to die. And he pleaded before the Lord and said, Lord, remember how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. There are days that come in the life of a man, in the life of a woman, that a problem arises in his life and he cannot help himself and nobody can help him. And the care, caring people all around cannot help and only God can help. And at such a time, what will give him confidence before the Lord is the way he had walked with God. But if he had been wobbling, if he had been insincere, if he had not been living right, he cannot come like Hezekiah and be pleading before the Lord, remember how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. And I've done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept so, and it came to pass, for Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, turn again and tell Ezekiah the captain of my people, Ezekiah the captain of my people. You know, sometimes they say the higher you go, the cooler you become. When you become the captain of the people, a leader over the people, a pastor over the people, an overseer over the people, a superintendent over the people, sometimes there are people that think they now live above the law. Their position, they think, makes them to be lawless. Because now nobody can challenge me. I'm the overall leader. At such a time as Ezekiah found himself, that he had this terminal disease, and even Isaiah the prophet will not pray for him because God had said, tell him he will die. The only thing he had to plead before the Lord is that, Lord, remember how I have walked with you. And God has sent his prayer. I pray we'll walk with God. I said we'll walk with God with a perfect heart, with a sincere heart, with his transparent life. And when it comes to our turn to pray, a prayer like this, God will answer your prayer. Turn again and tell Ezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I didn't get an amen. amen. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. No, I desire to pray for him. Behold, I will heal thee. And there was no other promise to claim because you have walked with God. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up to the house of the Lord. And I will add, and I will add, and I will add unto thy days. How many years? Fifteen years. That's the benefit, that's the privilege. That's the glory of walking with God. There are many others. Let's look at Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 4. Malachi chapter 2, verse 4. It says in verse 4, in Malachi chapter 2, verse 4, and ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, 
and I gave them to him for the fear where we is. He feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his leaves. He walked with me in peace and equity. He walked with me in a straightforward manner. He walked with me uprightly. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many from iniquity. For the priest lives should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of course. You see many other people that were turned away from sin unto righteousness and they walked with God. What if you see somebody not having a good equipment or tool like you have and that fellow cleared the field and everything is very clean. What if you saw somebody that did not have the teaching you have, the grace you have, the strength you have, the anointing you have, the power you have, the church you have, the teachings you have, and the regular fellowships you have? What if you see somebody who does not have all those advantages and he did well? then you know you don't have any excuse not to do well as we see the people in the Old Testament not having all the privileges we have not having the whole Bible not having sufficient grace like we have abundance of grace like we have and they walked with God in righteousness those of us that have the grace and the outpouring of the Spirit and the teaching of the Scripture in the New Testament we don't have any excuse. And those of us who belong to a church like this, and you listen to the study on Monday, you listen to teaching on Tuesday, and you listen on Saturday, and you listen on Sunday, and you listen on Thursday, the encouragement comes, the strength comes, the power comes, and the enlightenment comes, the exposition of the word comes. They didn't have all that in the Old Testament. And we have that. And so those of us living on this side of the cross, on this side of Calvary, we don't have any excuse at all. We will walk with God. You will walk with God. Look at the New Testament now in Luke chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Zechariah and Elizabeth walked with God. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the cause of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. New Testament people, actually, there they was still part of the Old Testament. Now we come to John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1 from verse 13. Luke chapter 1 verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. It shall be great in the sight of the Lord, not in the sight of the Pharisees or the Sadducees, those people never respected anybody except those who keep their tradition. But the man will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall return to the Lord 
their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist walked with the Lord. John the Beloved also walked with the Lord. Look at First John chapter 1, John the Beloved, John chapter 1, from verse 1, that which for from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, a fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie. If we, any of us apostles, if we depend on our position, on our authority, nobody can discipline us, nobody can catch us, nobody can say anything to us, we're appointed by Christ and nobody can remove us. If we, because of that, say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we we'll lie and do not the truth. If we make ourselves like Deuterophis, that makes himself a Lord, a God, over the people of God, and will act anyhow and believe, behave anyhow, and say, after all, we are here. If we don't allow anybody into this church, they will not come in. If we don't allow anybody to minister, they will not minister. If because of that, that authority we arrogate to ourselves, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we will lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. He walked with God, we will walk with God. I said, we will walk with God. Whatever others do, we will do right. However others live, I will live right. I was wanting you to say that. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they walked with God. John the Baptist walked with God. John the Beloved walked with God. Of course, Peter and the rest of all the apostles, they walked with God. Paul, the apostle, apostle to the Gentiles, also walked with God. In Philippians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 16. Philippians chapter 3, verse 16. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. The totality, the entirety of the Word of God is for every believer and is for every minister. It's for Paul and all the other people that were like Paul. And it says, because of that, let us all mind the same sin. Let us walk by the same rule, brethren. Be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. And it's not only Paul the Apostle, many others too, they walked with God. And if they had the grace, we also will have the grace. We will walk with God. First Thessalonians chapter 4, I read from verse 1, Furthermore then, 
we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God. Ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye will abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we give you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. We will walk in the light. We will walk in the truth. We will walk in the spirit. We will walk to please the Lord all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. Now, what do we do when we are walking with God? How do we live our lives? What do we get involved in? What are we occupied with while we are walking with the Lord? Point number three now, our godly engagement while walking with God. Our glorious engagement while walking with God. Our gospel engagement while we are walking with God. Uh, you, you remember this verse of scripture? Let me just remind you, Amos chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 3. Amos chapter 3, we're looking at verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Walking with God means that we're in agreement with God. We're in agreement with the Father, agreement with the Son, we're in agreement with the Holy Ghost. Walking with God means come into full, complete, uninterrupted agreement with God. What do we know about God that He wants us to agree with? Well, His attributes and then His passion and compassion. Second Peter, I'm reading from chapter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God. That's his nature. That's his attribute. That is his character. He does not want anyone to perish. Well, if I'm in agreement with God, I will not want anyone to perish. They're living in sin. And they're going the way of eternal perdition. But God does not want them to perish. And I am walking with God, and you are walking with God, so you'll be engaged in what God demands. What God demands. We are looking at Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I read from verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Why? He doesn't want anyone to perish. And you are walking with God. Because you are walking with God, you are in agreement with God. You too, you don't want anyone to perish. And in verse 19, to which that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. You are in agreement with God. You are walking with God. And God is reconciling men unto himself. What are you doing then? You are also reconciling men unto him. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Are you walking with me? I want them reconciled with me. And so I committed it. I committed your hand the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God, look at this, as though God himself did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, we're standing on behalf of Christ, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's what it means to walk with God. The engagement we have, the assignment we have, the commission we have, 
while we're walking with God. We cannot say, I'm walking with God, and then I fold my hand. I see sinners perishing. I fold my hands. I see people going down the drain, and they're being washed up onto a lost eternity. And I close my mouth, and I close my eyes. All I want, I want this, I want this, I want this. And once God is answering my prayer, and God is blessing me, that's all I care for. We cannot walk with God like that. We must be engaged we must be occupied in the things that God himself wants done. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 30, 30 to 32. Ezekiel chapter 18. And we're reading from verse 30. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 30, Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent. That's what God wants. If you are walking with God, you'll be in agreement with God. And as God is telling the people in your community, in your office, in your marketplace, in your village, in your town, anywhere you are, as he is telling them, repent, you will have the same message for them. Because you are walking with God, you are in agreement with God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will ye die O house of Israel that's your godly engagement that's your godly commission that you are telling other people if you are walking with God and you are in agreement with God for I have no pleasure in the death of him that died you too, if you have the same mind with God, with Christ, with the Holy Spirit you have no pleasure in the death of him that died says the Lord God wherefore turn yourselves and leave ye we are walking with God the Father we are also walking with God the Son. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 6. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. If we say we are walking with Christ, then we ought to live as he lived. His passion will be our passion. His compassion will be our compassion. His occupation, when he was here on earth, will be our occupation. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. What did he do when he was here? Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, a redeemer. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 10. If we're walking with Christ, this is our engagement. If we're walking with Christ, this is our occupation. This is what he did when he was there. And this is what we'll keep doing. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It says, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And those who are walking with him, look at verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. If Christ were on earth today, every day, 
he'll reach somebody. He'll touch somebody. He'll talk to one sinner. He'll attract one sinner. He'll bring one sinner into the kingdom. And he says, if you're walking with me, you must act and you must walk like I walk. And I have no pleasure in the days of those who die. He went over Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had known at this hour what belongs to your peace, but it is hidden from you. And then he said, he was seeking the, he was seeking the laws to save them. And he says, you are walking with me. That's your engagement. That's your occupation. Occupy till I come. If we're walking with the Father, we will evangelize. If we're walking with the Son, we will evangelize. If we're walking with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, we will evangelize. I'm looking at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. You're in agreement with God the Father. You're in agreement with God the Son. You're in agreement with God the Holy Ghost you will be engaged in evangelism. John chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom, the, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He'll tell of me that I'm Savior, He'll tell of me that I came to save and I've made the final sacrifice. Verse 27, and ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. If we have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we will do what the Holy Spirit delights to be done. That he is or will evangelize. In John chapter 8 verse 9. John chapter 8 verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, it's none of his. If we have the spirit of Christ, he wants the sinner saved. And you remember, he was the one that actually told the Philip to get to lead the eunuch of Ethiopia unto the Lord as his personal savior. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him reach the prophet Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And then we're told the place where he was reading. And in verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him, Jesus. The Spirit directed him. The Spirit led him. And if we have the Spirit of God, that's exactly what we will do today. Acts chapter 11, verse 12. Acts 11, verse 12. And the Spirit bid me go with them, nothing doubting. If you're in agreement with the Father, you'll evangelize. You don't want anyone to perish like the Father doesn't want anyone to perish. You will evangelize. If you're in agreement with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, you will evangelize. If you're in agreement with the Spirit of God, you're walking in the Spirit, you will evangelize. It tells us in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say come. The bride is in agreement. The bride of Christ, the believers, the church, every member of the church in agreement with the spirit. As the spirit is saying to the sinners come, the bride is also saying come. The spirit and the bride say come. And let him that hear us say come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. 
I pray we will be engaged in this great work of the Great Commission and of preaching the gospel in Jesus' name. That's the practical thing entailed in walking with the Father, walking with the Son, walking with the Spirit. Rescue the perishing as God demands. Reach out to people as Christ desires. Restore the prodigals as the Spirit directs. The Spirit will direct us every day. It will direct us to sinners. It will direct us to backsliders. It will direct us to unbelievers. And as He directs us, the Lord will give us the grace, will give us the boldness, will give us the courage of touch sinners around us, will bring them into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Will you? I will. Will you? Will you? The Lord will make the work to prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. Let's try to stop and talk to the Lord as we have learned today of the glorious privilege of walking with God. Open your mouth. Talk to the Lord. You need grace to walk with Him, faith to walk with Him, strength to walk with Him, courage to walk with Him, conviction to walk with Him. Tell the Lord, help me, Lord. Every sin I've heard, I'll be a doer of the Word.